Hello? Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have your attention? Welcome aboard Frank's Magic Bus. Now, without further ado, Frank Welch. Yeah, jump on board the Magic Bus. Just be careful of the hippies there. Don't trip over the hippies. Ah, oh, there goes another one there. Hey, if you could travel back in time, get aboard a time machine, and visit the very historic times in rock and roll history, where would you end up? Well, you would have to want to be at Woodstock, right, in the summer of 69, in the mud, and the blood, and the beer, and the drugs. You would have to want to be in the audience back in February 1964 uh, during the Ed Sullivan Show that Sunday night when the Beatles were introduced to America there. And you'd want to maybe lean up against a building there on, in Memphis outside Sun Records back in 1954 when a certain little truck driver from uh, Tupelo, Mississippi was cutting some demos, right? Well, if I could get in a rock and roll time machine, I'd want to go back to 1965 in the summer to the Newport Folk Festival when the king of folk music and protest music, acoustic music at that time, Bob Dylan, freaked everybody out at the Newport Folk Festival and went electric, brought out a big folk band, uh, made the folkies go crazy, their jaws dropped, uh, set the rock music world on its ear. Our guest is Murray Lerner. He was the guy that filmed Bob Dylan going electric back in 1965 at the Newport Folk Festival. Uh, Dylan showed up and everybody was shocked except his band that he had to hide in backstage and they came out and all the folkies and all these, you know, college, uh, well, they weren't beatniks, they were actually pre-hippies at that time. We're getting ready to hear him, you know, how many, and he came out with a full band. That was it. And it made history right then. And Murray says, yeah, he was kind of aware that he was filming and seeing rock and roll history that day in 1965. Absolutely, yeah. It's really quite a dramatic scene. Really one of the iconic moments in, in rock and roll history, obviously. Yes. You know, I've heard differing viewpoints from people who were there and who most of the people, like rock critics, who were not there about the uh, legendary crowd reaction. But you were there. What was the reaction? Was it mixed or what? It definitely was mixed. There's no question about it. Of course, my concentration was on filming, but it was a mesmerizing moment, you know. I mean, I, I could see that things were going to change after that. I liked it, by the way. I went wild over it. But it's interesting, at a screening I had in the New York Film Festival, uh, it really was a, a revealing incident. After the screening, there's a Q&A. Someone got up and said, I was there, I was sitting right in front of the stage, and there was no booing from the audience, only from the performers behind the stage. So I said, well, I don't agree with you. I don't actually think performers would boo uh, so he said, no, I'm absolutely positive. Another guy got up and said, well, I was not quite in front of the stage, but I heard booing only from the press section and from performers under the stage. So I said, well, there were no, no one was under the stage that I know of. It's your opinion. And then a third guy got up and said, I was there. And I was in the audience. There was no question there was booing in the audience. He was close to the stage. He also said there was no booing from the stage, but there was booing from the audience. Now, that's three different people who were there. That is really funny. Uh, Murray, do you think that with with that revelation that maybe people who wanted to hear either or heard that? So if they were against him going electric, maybe they heard the boos, and if they liked it, maybe they heard the claps. You're absolutely right. That's very well put. Very well put. And, of course, memory changes things. And uh, selective memory... No, that's a very, very good point, but I was glad it happened, by the way. I would say that, that there's no question in my mind it was a mixture of booze. And if you saw the great Martin Scorsese documentary No Direction Home on Dylan, you heard a story told there about the old folky, the old protest banjo playing folky Pete Seeger wanting to grab an axe, being so angry when he heard that Dylan was going to play with a full band, attempting to cut the cables and the speaker wires. We talk with Murray about his film footage and Pete Seeger's angry acts. Now, I watched a Scorsese documentary, uh, No Direction Home. On that was Dylan. my footage, you know. I, I was going to ask you that, if that was your footage. That's yeah, amazing. Yeah, that, that, that's my Maggie's farm was mine. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, in that documentary, and I've heard this before, too, <laughs> that uh, the old folky Pete Seeger had kind of a crazy reaction to that, didn't he? I don't think so. I, I mean, about the axe? Yeah, about the No, magic. not the slightest possibility. I don't think so. I think you don't think that happened? No, not at all. Not that, I mean, I would stake a lot on that. Pete isn't that way. He might uh, say he hated it, but he wouldn't have done that. No. <laughs> so maybe that's, that's just embellishment over the years, I guess. Yes. Huh? I, uh, it, 
it's been said that, but uh, knowing what I know of Pete Seeger, I, I can't imagine that he would even dream of doing that. And I don't think there was an axe behind the stage to begin with. That's funny. I always wondered that, too. Where'd they get the darn axe from? But I mean, maybe he carries an axe with him but to show his humble beginnings, but I don't think so. Well, hey, he was a radical Marxist at the time. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's get to the performance itself now. Back in the summer of 65, Bob Dylan going electric at the Newport Folk Festival. He had been, uh, you know, the king of acoustic uh, protest folk music there in the early 60s. He was Bob Dylan, you know, the icon, but he hadn't really gone electric. I mean, this is like a year and a half after the Beatles hit the Ed Sullivan Show in early 1964. And uh, Murray says that his big super band that he brought out, including Al Cooper and some others, picked Maggie's Farm as the song to hit the stage with. Murray says that was a great choice. Maggie's Farm is a great number because, in a sense, we're, we are, we're all working on Maggie's Farm. It's, a, it's really a song about, you know, work and the oppressiveness of work that can happen to you. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a real American thing, I think, uh, myth, you know. It was perfect. And then in the face of the crowd, when there was booing, he says, you know, everybody wants me to be like them, but I just want to be like I am. Something like that is the lyrics. That's what made Dylan so great. Didn't he have a couple of big, well, future big name guys? Wasn't Al Cooper in that band? Yes. Al Cooper was the uh, keyboard player, the organist. And he used an organ, which was incredible sound for that time. Hmm. And Bloomfield was the guitar player. I almost said Paul Butterfield, but it was Bloomfield, right? It was, yeah, Butterfield did not play. The Butterfield Blues Band had played a day earlier.